Hello everyone. Today we are going to be, uh, well, starting the series that is the alternate Cold War. This is just a little prologue, which is why I'm even narrating this. Uh, this is just a prologue of kind of like how like this is like World War II and how the end of World War II is going to lead to this alternate Cold War scenario. This is just to give you like a little taste and like explain how like what's going to happen in this alternate scenario happens. This is going to like show the events leading up to it. As you can see, we are still definitely in uh, World War II times. You can see out of the borders of like 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 I know Spain wasn't actually an Axis country in World War II, but you know we're just doing that to kind of give it like also for the alternate scenario. But just because I think the map looks a lot better fully colored in, and obviously Switzerland isn't colored in because Switzerland is Switzerland. Also, these guys down here, I, I don't even think all of South America was involved in the war or any of it, but uh, I know there definitely wasn't any Axis countries down here, but there was in this scenario, and they're occupied. Now, unlike in most of my videos, the Axis aren't actually going to be winning this war. Huh, go figure. Usually in all my videos, it's either an Axis victory or something along that lines. No, the Axis is still going to get absolutely dominated in this scenario. And this comes right after a major Allied counteroffensive actually goes successful with American troops landing in Africa and Middle Eastern troops, well, troops from over here in Asia, like from British India and some from China, but they're mostly trying to fend off the Jap Japanese. They sent some of their troops over here and managed to capitulate a rock, and majority of the Axis colonies that were down here in Africa have now been beaten back. Now, it's just uh, basically one solid front line over here, which is uh, a lot smaller now. The Japanese were also heavily pushed back down here in the East Indies. They used to control all the way to over here in New Guinea, but now they've been pushed back, and now all of Borneo and... Indonesia and all of New Guinea has been completely liberated. The Axis were also pushed out of Burma. We see yet another Allied counteroffensive against the Axis countries in Europe and over here in the Pacific. The Axis over here in Europe, they've been pushed completely out of the Middle East, well, almost completely out of the Middle East, southern Turkey, and they've been completely pushed out of Africa, except for this little fort that Spain still holds on to for some reason. The area around Gibraltar. Japan, however, was brutally beaten back as they now no longer hold any of Southeast Asia, they no longer hold Manchuria, and they no longer hold Malaya or the Philippines. They have now just been reduced down to their regular self. Seems like unlike in our scenario, Japan will actually be the first major Axis country to surrender. And then we have a terrible day for the Axis coming around. On this one day, whatever day it is, both Turkey and Japan, they both surrender almost at the exact same time. The Axis have now just been squeezed down to the European continent, and it's not looking good. Now in our scenario, there were two major allied landings, one in Italy and one in Normandy, you know, D-Day, how are you going to miss that? But in this timeline, there's going to be three major allied landings. Of course, Normandy and Italy. But there's also going to be a landing in Iberia, more specifically off the coast of Portugal. Also, I completely forgot the Soviets occupied Manchuria. They also occupy Korea and the rest of Sakhalin, but that's not shown. And now we see a massive counteroffensive in Europe, with Germany now being whittled down to just their mainland, Denmark, and Sweden. And obviously, the Soviet Union led the charge in Eastern Europe as they take back, well, basically all of Eastern Europe except for Greece and Albania, which the Allies managed to take before the Soviet Union got a majority of the land. They actually managed to take Finland, which is very surprising because usually the Soviet Union doesn't really handle that well against Finland. Now next, we do in a scenario where Finland wins World War II. And of course, the three major Allied landings. The one in Italy, which makes Italy effectively switch sides, and I, I've got to fix this, hold up. With Italy switching sides, their colonies also have to switch sides. 
There was also that major landing in Iberia, which effectively defeated Spain, and the landing in Normandy, which liberated all the Benelux in France. And here we see the major plot twist happen, with the Allies actually being stalemated on the western border with Germany, as Germany really did not want the Allies winning. The Soviet Union encircled Berlin before the Allies could even break the defensive and get into Germany, and that effectively made all of Germany fall into Soviet hands. They also captured Denmark, Austria, and Sweden. So as we see, the Soviet Union got a lot more out of World War II in this timeline than they did in our own timeline. And that is how the alternate scenario is going to play out. Let's take a look at the Treaty of Berlin. Out of the Treaty of Berlin, we see that things are a lot different over here in Asia, and also pretty different over here in Europe. So, what is happening? Why is NATO not as strong as they were in our timeline? This is simply because with the Soviet victory in World War II, yes, they actually said that it was a Soviet victory, not an Allied victory, as because of the tensions between the two being even greater in this timeline than they were in World War II in our timeline, because tensions were still there, they actually were separated into three factions, the Allies, the Axis, and the Communists. The Communists actually won World War II, and communism, as a result of, you know, them defeating Germany all by themselves, this kind of made the Soviets, the Soviet Union's communism, made it really popular between all these countries in Asia, which is why Pakistan, India, China, all of Southeast Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, all these countries have fallen victim to communism. And both Spain and Italy, they are not allowed into NATO yet for a few years, as they were both on the side of the Axis, and so NATO doesn't fully trust these two countries. Well, they're going to have to get that trust quickly, because it doesn't look like the Soviet Union wants to play nice. Also, NATO is not limited to the North Atlantic. That's why we see countries like Liberia, and well, technically these guys over here are occupied. Liberia is a semi-colony of the United States. In the Guiana region, they're colonized by these guys still. So, you know, decolonization happened, but not to as great of an extent as it did in our timeline. The United States, being the strongest country in the world, kept most of their colonies, though. Actually not being the strongest country in the world, they're actually now second, with the Soviet Union actually being the strongest. This is, once again, due to so many countries basically being dependent on the Soviet Union and them having a lot of influence over Asia and Europe. Now, how did they get Iran? Well, after World War II, well, before World War II ended, there was a deal between the British and the Soviet Union. There was a deal to both pull out of Iran once World War II ended. And in our timeline, the Soviet Union didn't want to, but pressure from the UN forced them to. Well, the UN basically consists of, well, most of the communist countries, so they stayed in Iran and even took the rest of it over. Because, I mean, really, what's the UN going to do to all of this? Now, if you want to see this scenario continue, you'll have to find out what happens in episode one.